joined by our good friend uh, Jonathan Ornstein of the uh, Krakow JCC. Uh, Jonathan, you're keeping uh, quarantined and, and social distancing and, and house arrest and, and all the rest of it down there? Pretty much, pretty much, yeah. I've been mean, walking my dog, uh, but besides that, not too much, uh, not too much activity. My wife and I are keeping keeping away from everyone else. Tell us, uh, tell us what you see on the streets of, uh, or what you don't see on the streets of Kashmir these days. So it's pretty interesting. You know, we live right in the center of Kashmir, and you know, you're, you're aware that Kashmir has a ton of a ton of students and a ton of tourists. And a lot of Airbnb, but you don't really, you never really understood that until you walk around the streets. I walk my dog every night for like, you know, go out and for a good walk and just walk up and down the streets of Kazimish. And I, I think about 90% of the windows are, are dark. Wow. I really don't think that any, I mean, there's a few streets on the edge of Kazimish, which are a little more residential, but really in the, for most of Kazimish, it's just, there's nobody here. And I walk, I, I go for a half hour walk with the dog without seeing anybody, nobody walking around. So it's really, you're really reminded of just how, how, how much, uh, just how central tourism is to, to Kazimish and that there's just not that many people living there. I'm curious, uh, given what we've seen over the last few days with, with the police and even the army, really, like really enforcing um, no-go zones in the center of town. You, you see these stories about people getting these crazy fines for biking and whatnot. Uh, what have you seen uh, in terms of like a police presence there on the street kind of enforcing the quarantine? What, what, what have you seen in, in your neighborhood? Yeah, there are, I've seen uh, police cruisers, cars driving by with, with speakers. And just, you know, saying reinforcing the quarantine, stay home, to only go out if it's essential, maintain, maintain distance, things like that, which I think is good. At the end of the day, listen, you know, you look around the world and countries that, that dealt with this early and, and severely and, and in a harsh way are the ones who have less, uh, you know, are, are less debt. And then there's just a direct correlation. So, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know, you know, I personally think that the, you know, the, almost the stricter, the better. Is anything uh, open there in your neighborhood uh, in Kashmir? So that maybe the the corner store job kind of things, or anything at all? Yeah, so the I guess the you know the Carrefours and the the Jabka and Kotsik and things like that are open. Not much else. There are a couple restaurants that are doing takeaway, but not really. You know, it, it's interesting. It's like a ghost town, and then every so often, just an Uber Eats bicycle flies by you. Yeah, Uber it's Eats like, <laughs> everywhere. Post, it's true. Right. Strange post, post-apocalyptic world where the only ones left are Uber Eats cyclists. Who are just it seems that way by for you. sure. Hey, let's talk about um, the JCC closed down, obviously. Uh, give us an idea under normal circumstances, you know, pre-corona, give us an idea of the kind of foot traffic, the kind of the kind of people, the number of people that would go through the doors of the JCC on, again on a, on, a, on a normal day. Yeah, so we've been closed since, I guess, March 10th, March 12th, something like that. And we were getting about, uh, probably worked out to ten to 15,000 visitors a month, depending on the month. That's so like 500 a, a day, 600 a day. Yeah, ton, wow. Ton of footfall, lots of classes going on, lots of tourists, lots of lectures, just, you know, dozens and dozens of activities every week. All of that's shut down. We've migrated a lot of that online. So we have about 300 people studying Hebrew here. So we've moved all that to Zoom. Um, you know, at what we've been able to move to Zoom, we have, uh, we also have, uh, you know, a preschool here in the building that's obviously not taking place. So we're, you know, the teachers are helping the parents in terms of the curriculum for the kids. And, uh, but really, I think one of the scariest aspects for us is that we have a senior club. We have about 50 Holocaust survivors that are members here that come into the building six days a week and they're here till eight o'clock at night and we're really doing a lot to take care of them. And, uh, so they're, you know, they're at home very often they're isolated. So we've started food delivery. We're picking up their medicine for them and bringing that to them. And, 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 you know, especially as they're the most, you know, they're in a normal world, they're the most vulnerable. And now they're even more vulnerable because of the way that, uh, Corona, Corona, you know, attacks the, the elderly or, or the elderly are more, uh, more, you know, susceptible to, to having it more seriously. So we have to be extra careful with them. So that's been a challenge for us and we're really, you know, the center was set up primarily, you know, years and years ago to take care of the, uh, to care, care of our Holocaust survivors. And we're very mindful of trying to do that during this strange, uh, difficult time right now. No, you're right. Not only are they, um, <clears throat> sorry, not only are they more at risk in the medical sense, but you know, the seniors, but 
uh, you know, generally speaking, I'm sure there are some exceptions to this, but generally speaking, there may be less likely to easily adapt to the some of the digital solutions that you're putting out there. And so they might need a little bit of extra help, you know, maybe not face to face, maybe isn't the best term to use under the circumstances, but you, know, you, might, you might have to get out there and kind of help them in, in ways that other people don't require that kind of help. Yeah, absolutely. So we're, we're trying, we call them, we cycle through and we call all of them every two days. So we're calling three, everybody gets a call at least three times a week. Uh, and that can be, you know, half hour call sometimes to all of our, to all of our seniors. We have staff doing that. Uh, you know, people obviously have had to change their, what, what they're doing. We have 37 full-time staff here. Everyone's still fully employed, which is a challenge for us as well as we're not getting new visitors. People aren't coming in. We're not getting the, you know, the income from donations and stuff that we usually are. So that's been a challenge as, you know, for me personally, I, you know, I see it as, you know, I have a staff here an amazing, amazing staff doing great work and I want to keep them all, keep them all employed as, you know, to, to, you know, as much as possible and, you know, not, not, uh, not have to lay anybody off, not have to reduce people's salaries or things. I know that a lot of that's going on. Uh, so we're trying to find new tasks for people to do, not just busy work, but as I said, we're taking, calling all the Holocaust survivors all the time to, you know, important, important things like that. Hey, let me ask you about something we learned uh, just a few days ago, maybe a week ago, actually. Now, uh, they officially announced the um, the cancellation of this year's Krakow Jewish Festival. Huge, huge loss to the kind of the cultural calendar of, of uh, events uh, in the city and uh, just a massive, massive event generally. Um, can you tell us, uh, well, first of all, can you kind of clarify the relationship between the JCC and the Jewish festival. You maybe explained this to us before when you kind of visited us in, in our studio, but what's the relationship between the JCC and the, and the Jewish festival, first of all, and then generally, what do you make of the, uh, the circumstances that, you know, the, the, around the cancellation? So sure. So the, the Jewish culture festival was uh, founded, I think in 1988 has been going on in the first couple of and every year, first couple of years, it was biannually. And since then it's been every year, until this year, as you as you mentioned, canceled or postponed until uh, till the next year. So I guess canceled for this year. But it's an independent uh, organization. It's its own NGO with its own staff, and they have a lot of volunteers. And uh, they've been doing what they've been doing for a very, very long time. And it's become not only one of the main cultural events in, uh, in Krakow, but the largest Jewish cultural festival in at least Europe, if not the world. So really a main, major, major event for the, for the whole Jewish world and for the city of Krakow. Uh, we are a partner of the festival, so we work with them. We have our own events going on during the festival that we put on, and also they have some of their events uh, that are their official festival events inside our building. And then they publish a uh, like a folder, or they, uh, they publish a guide to the festival, and our events are in there as well as accompanying events. So we don't run the festival. The festival is its own thing, but we work very closely with the festival. As it's does, it's fair example, to say that you're the, affiliated, the, you're affiliated, but separate, I guess we can say. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I know they have their own organization, but we work very closely with them, especially during the festival when we're putting on events uh, as well. Uh, so yeah, we, uh, last week they announced that it's, uh, that it's canceled this year, which is totally understandable. It's a very complicated organism, the festival, with people coming, uh, artists, you know, a few hundred artists. From all over the world, from yeah. All, from, all, from all over the world and flights and hotels and all of those things that, that go into it. So they had to make that decision, which is uh, which is a difficult decision. But, uh, of course, you know, so we support that and are excited to, you know, for, for, it, to, for it to be back. Yeah, uh, massively, and massively it. disappointing, but... Yeah, again, you know, who's going to who's going to criticize this decision under the circumstances? It seems like the right thing to do. I'm curious. I don't know if you have any knowledge about this, if you were in privy to any kind of the discussions around this. But was was delaying it ever an option instead of canceling altogether? Is there some reason it had to be in that time window? Could it not be in October, November, or, so, or was it simply not worth the uncertainty of postponing to a date that maybe would have had to have been canceled again? What do you think? So I wasn't privy to the discussions, but I just think that that's the timing. They always time it. It's always the exact same time right after the school year ends. And there are a lot of people who, a lot of artists that come back every year and that fits into their schedule. Um, I think over the summer is not going to happen. September, you start to have the Jew Jewish holidays, which uh, all come in a row. Uh, and that makes it difficult. So there's really a kind of a small window, I think, that that, that, that could have been. Uh, that could be the case. And I think it's just so identified with that end of June, beginning of July, that my guess is that's why they didn't think of, uh, didn't think of moving it. And just logistically, it's a, it's a tough, 
tough to move something like that to a different part, a different time during the during the calendar. You know, Krakow there's a lot of conventions and a lot of big events going on in Krakow during the year, and to do something like that on that scale when you have that time that you usually do it, I think it's tough to move it. Which we were looking at. You know, we we have our bicycle ride at the same time. We do ride to the living, which has grown and grown. We had. 250 participants last year, looking at 300 participants, people coming from all over. And we're trying to figure out what that looks like. We haven't canceled it yet, but that's going to be something uh, something that'll be greatly uh, much smaller this year if it, if it goes on. Yeah, so, so, many, to, so, many uh, parts, so many parts, so many moving parts and all this. And just, as you say, um, to, to coordinate, to synchronize everything is just such a massive logistical challenge. And, and unfortunately, cancellation is probably the... The, the the least the least problematic of, of all the options I guess so what are you going to do um, Jonathan I don't want to keep you too long because uh, you're actually as as we speak today it's it's Wednesday the eighth today's the beginning of uh, Passover actually and you're in preparing for um for, for that can you can you I'll put you on the spot here before I let you go can you give us the <laughs> the, the Judaism one hundred and one uh, 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 meaning of, of a Passover before we let you go. Of course I can. So tonight, uh, Passover is an important, very important, one of the most important Jewish holidays. And they say it's a Jewish holiday that most Jews celebrate. Even if people are the, you know, atheists and not at all into religion and never go to synagogue, Passover, people usually celebrate. And we have a, uh, a special meal called the Seder. Seder means order. And we tell the story of the Exodus, of the Jews leaving Egypt and the plagues and that whole story in Moses. That whole thing is the story that we tell tonight. And it really sort of encapsulates the idea of, of Judaism uh, uh, as well, and, and there's a, we read from a special book called the Haggadah, uh, like, which is, tells the story, and it's, we've been more or less following the same structure for, for a couple thousand years. Uh, and uh, th- that, so we normally would have that at the JCC. We have about 200 people that participate every year. We have a Seder special, divide the dinner up, one for students, one for Holocaust survivors, one for young families, one for guests from all over. And of course, we're not doing that this year, so we've moved it to Zoom. I'll be leading a Zoom Seder, and also we'll have some of the older people who can't use Zoom will call in by telephone, and just to be able to participate in this very, very important Jewish uh, story. And I think it really is that, you know, it's it's always this classic tale of Judaism, always going from sort of persecution and from darkness, always moving forward to a better future, and being able to celebrate that. Uh, in Poland, where the survivors themselves are, are, have gone from really, they themselves have gone from slavery to freedom. It's pretty remarkable to be able to celebrate that here. So we're sorry we're not doing it in person, but we're, we're happy that the, you know, the technology exists that allow us to come together as a community. We sent uh, packages, we delivered packages to people that need them uh, in our community, needier people, and just so people can have all the special food that we eat during this holiday. So we've been cooking and doing that and sending masa, the flat unleavened bread that we eat, that's traditional classic food from uh, Passover that actually is in Poland all year round. So there's a lot of, you know, you see a lot of this influence uh, from, from, from the Jews on Poland that you can go into any shop and buy matzah. It's a little bit different than the way that we do it, but this classic bread that when the Jews left uh, left Egypt, they didn't have time for the bread to rise. So the bread, uh, it's this unleavened bread, which is uh, the typical food from matzah. So uh, that's what we'll eat tonight, and we'll raise a glass to to freedom. Boy, Passover on Zoom. We, we really do live in, in strange times, don't we? Very strange times, my friend. And you mentioned one more thing, kind of made me laugh when you said that uh, you, when you said that uh, Passover is kind of like for the Jews that are typically not observant, you know, it's, it's the one time of year when they're, you know, kind of maybe more, uh, more dedicated to their faith. And it reminded me of the concept of, of Christmas Catholics, you know, once a year, they yeah. get serious about it. And then, you know, the next day they might go back to their previous lives. But uh, so is it, is it fair to, to call, to, is it fair to say that there are, you know, Passover Jews, just like there are Christmas Catholics kind of, you know, once a year? Absolutely. Absolutely. People that this, it's like, I think with Americans, like Thanksgiving, it's a time for when everyone comes together. Yeah. It's rare. It's very rare and has nothing to do with observance or anything. It's very rare for, for someone Jewish in any sense, just not to go to one of these uh, dinners, the, the first night of Passover. So. Well, Jonathan, we'll let you go for that. Uh, uh, what, what's, what's the, what's the greeting by the way? Uh, for, is there something you say for Passover? You know, it's, it's Merry Christmas, um, Happy Easter. What do you say for Passover? You can say happy Passover. You can yeah. say happy Passover. In, okay. That's a, that, that's pretty. Uh, that's a common one. Also in Hebrew, we for all the Jewish holidays, we say Chag Sameach, which just means 
general happy holidays. So that's and I can teach you a little bit of Hebrew. In my previous life, I, life I was a Hebrew teacher, John. Uh, so Chag Sameach. All right. Well, same to you, my friend. And oh, but uh, Passover lasts for a, a week or something like that. How many days is Passover? Uh, it lasts for eight days. Eight and days. And you're not allowed to eat, and you don't eat any bread. You have to eat only special products. So we don't eat no pizza, no sandwiches, no pasta for eight days. Okay. Eight days. Well, under the circumstances, I guess it's not too much of a, st- I mean, you know, not too many people eating their normal diet anyway right now. So maybe it's not the challenge it might normally be. Well, happy Passover to, to Jonathan and everyone else celebrating the uh, Passover. Uh, and thanks, Jonathan, for taking the time to uh, let us know how things are going there in Kashmir's and at the JCC. All the best to you. Stay safe. And uh, thanks to everybody for listening. Don't forget to go to our website, crackass.pl. Check out all of our back episodes. There are more than 210 episodes now. And uh, don't forget to give us a like or a share or whatever on Facebook. Help us with the great big algorithm in the sky. We appreciate you listening, and we'll catch you next time on The Crackcast. Cast.